تلخ براگون مشترم و سکور تونن و مدرو و سطور شزبران دارن و مطور لیر ببر برمنا که خیر و شغلند و Father, we just honor you and love you and worship and magnify and exalt you. Incredible, phenomenal, mind-blowing name, God, hey, love, hey. And we step in as the shun, step in as your sons and your daughters, Father, deep into the frequency of your heart. For it to overshadow us, to take us into a dimension of holiness, purity, for us to be reminded of who we are in you and who you are in us. Your glory to set in us and around us the fullness of who we are, for the fire of who you are to burn in us. Revelation, knowledge, insight, understanding, a new belief system, a new dimension of who you are in our hearts and who we know you to be. I ask, Father, that you will set each of us on a new path, a deeper place, a higher place, a wider place in you. Let's begin to understand who you are at levels that we never thought possible to know you. You are beautiful, you are incredible, Father, and our real desire is to go more intimate with you, to grow deeper and deeper in intimacy, to get to know you to such a level that there's no hidden secrets, there's no mysteries, and we have found all that is that, is, that there is. <laughs> you know, that sounds incredibly impossible because you're an infinite God. But let us truly go that deep, Father. Let's be reminded that we are spirit beings in your image and likeness set to live and move and have our being in you. Father, we love you. We praise you, my King. You are majestic. Thank you, Yahweh. Amen. 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 Thank you, Connor. Bless you, sir. How are y'all doing? Marvelous. Marvelous. Amazing. Marvelous. <laughs> Maybe switch on one side of lights. I think it's a little bit dark. Everyone's wearing black. <laughs> and it was, you know, it's like minus five outside. That's the mystery. Huh? That's the mystery. It's the deep, <laughs> deep revelations. That's the mystery. It looks good on Facebook and YouTube. It looks good on YouTube. You can hear me? Oh, let's tell me if you can hear me. As long as you can hear me, I guess it's good. Because what I'm going to try and do tonight is I want to give you some practical ideas for growing in intimacy. You know, going deeper and deeper and deeper, higher into your shoulders. To remind yourself that there's so much Yahweh has given us as sons and daughters to activate who we truly are and who He wants us to become. You know, um, I always say this, but your choice in life really truly only starts once you accept Yeshua as your Savior and the ignition of your spirit man is, is rebirthed into its full capacity. I say rebirth, please don't think. And I know this is what we've been taught, but please never think that your spirit was a baby. Okay, honestly, that's ridiculous. No, you little baby. Now, your spirit's an ancient being that was carried in the loins of Yahweh before time was time. He even says it in his word. It says, I've known you before you were in the matrix of your mother's womb. Now, for me, it's only 48 years ago. But we have to understand something. What was before I was in the womb? Mm. Now, I also say this because you have to remind yourself, I had to agree to my scroll before I was sent into the womb. Right. So for a baby to agree <laughs> on anything is ridiculous to even think. <laughs> right? So I was an ancient being on an ancient path that has revelation and insight and knowledge that I carried as a son of the Most High God from before eons of time. Before the was, was, was. I was there. We say, well, I don't understand how that works, because you only understand the day that you were conceived, the day that you were born, and the day that you die. Because we are born in a time and space understanding. But when you go and begin to walk in the heavens, you, you shift from that understanding into a place where there's no beginning and there's no end. It's eternity. It's eternal. It is an infinite God. It's an infinity. So if He has planned for us to be, that plan was there from the beginning. That means I have been there from the beginning because I've always been in him. And the Bible in the beginning says in. And we understand the Hebrew concept of in is actually the end. So the beginning is the end because he doesn't start anything. He hasn't finished first. So this is a revelation we have to carry in our hearts because once we understand that, it takes me out of that time and space understanding and I begin to shift into a realm where it doesn't matter what I do today. Now, I'm not saying don't worry about what you're doing today. Your today is very important. 
Just like your yesterday was very important, just like your tomorrow is going to be very important. Matter of fact, everything you do from the time that you get born from above is extremely important. Because Yahweh's desire for you is to continuously, consistently grow into a deeper and deeper place of intimacy with Him. For you to begin to understand that it's not like a marriage, it's not like a brotherhood, it's not like anything that we have really known in the earth. Because once you step into the heavens, you are beginning to understand the level of intimacy that He wants. It's a oneness. The oneness that we cannot have in creation. Because I cannot walk into anybody in the natural. Matter of fact, if I walk into Paul, if Paul runs from that side of the room, and I run from this side of the room, one of us is probably going to die. Paul, I'm sorry. It's going to be me. Right? We're not going to go into each other. We're going to run into each other. But we're not going to run, we're not going to be in each other. And, and in a spirit, it's different. In a spirit, I can be in almost everything and all things that's there. It's a different dimensional understanding because I am spirit. I have the freedom to be able to do all things. And we don't always understand that because the Bible tells us, all things are possible through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. How many of you are guaranteed not to be able to do in Christ a triple back somersault with the Things are possible. No, that's not quite what it's talking about. It's talking about a spiritual dimension that you step into in Christ because I'm seated in Him in heavenly places. So it's another gate that opens for me to step into. So it has to change my views and it has to change my perception of what I understand. And of course, like Paul says, get out of the flesh. And of course, everybody thinks, oh, it's sin, 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 sin. No, it's just, just get out of the natural realm that you live in, that you are bound by your soul and bound by your body, step into your spirit so you can enter into a realm where there's no time and space. So you can see it from a different point of view, and you can understand it from a different point of view. Yes. Practical ideas for growing in intimacy. I really want us to, to understand how desperately the Father craves intimacy. And I remind you, the original purpose and intake that He created us was to have a people that will worship Him. Right? right? Now, of course, our understanding of worship comes from what we've been taught. <laughs> Stand in front of him and do that. And see what he does. Now, I'm just going to slap you on the back of the head. That's what I would do. But what he would do, what he's done for me is, my son, that's not what I want. That's a concept of worship. That's not worship. That's not the worship I want. How many of you understand? The Bible tells us this. It's very weird, very strange. It says, Yahweh goes into a place and worships. What? Yahweh, God, worships? What, who does He worship? So if that's a fact, then we have to change our perception of worship. Because worship's not this. Worship is entering into that which created you, that which brought you forth, and becoming one with it as if it's you. I'm like, oh, uh, 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 what are you saying? You're God? No. no. I'm not saying I'm God. I'm saying that I came out of Him and He desires for me to go back in. Yeah. He desires for me to live and move and have my being, for me to understand what is inside of Him, who I am. That's why He says, You are the body, I'm the head. Yes. That is a dimension of intimacy that we don't even fathom, that we can't get to in our natural capacity. So He's drawing us in, and this is how you start changing your perception. You, you open the love gate. Now you have to understand, the love gate is a dimensional gate that opens, that brings you to the glory of God. The full measure of who He is. But for me to truly get to that place, I have to activate my other gates. I have to activate my body gates. Now I'm going to tell you, your body, your body gates is the very simple ones. It's the eyes, the nose, it's the ears, the mouth, and it's your feelings. But let me tell you something, you can't be directed in life according to any of these. For example, you're on a diet, right? And all of a sudden, Kentucky Fried Chicken has an ad on TV. I don't know if you know, 99% of that time, you're going to get in your vehicle and drive to Kentucky and buy some damn chicken. Right? Because it's activated a gate. Right? It's just it's something that we have to understand. So, it's about self-control. It's about understanding. It's about the not. What do I listen to? What do I speak? What do I feel? Do I base my entire life on a feeling? 
Let me tell you something. A familiar spirit will have you feel all kinds of ways. Mm. Well, I don't have any familiar spirits. Your average Christian has a dozen of them. That's 12. <laughs> Just by the way. Not a dozen, like a thousand. 12. Average Christian has 12 familiar spirits telling and speaking little voices in your head. You're not good enough. They don't like you. They don't want to be around you. You should probably stay away from that one and that one and that one. Because they don't have the best interest in heart. Now, it could be true. But I can't base what I feel as a fact. I can't do that. So my gate, my body gate has to be open. And it has to have the right perception. The right indication. The right revelation. Are you guys following me? Yeah. Same as my soul, my conscience, my reasoning, my imagination. Oh, we were taught to shut that imagina imagination down. Now all of a sudden we realize it's my third eye. Mm. Yes. Oh, Jesus, he's talking about new age. Help us, Lord. Well, where do they get it from? Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, they don't make it up. It doesn't just appear, it's not a lie. And if it is a lie, you have to understand something. And nothing that is a lie can only come from a lie. A lie comes from a truth. Right. So if there's a lie, and I reject it because it's a lie, I have to remind myself I'm light. And light has the capacity to take that which is in darkness and bring it back into the light. Yeah. So if there's a lie, then I have the power to turn the lie back into a truth. Now, we're so afraid of that because we were taught that that's wrong and that's not, that's from Satan, that's not for Christianity, that's from New Age, that's from Satanism, that's from Buddhism. Stay away from it, don't read that book, don't read that book. Right. Well, the truth is, Yeshua, Christos, the Christ, the yoke-destroying, burden-removing power of God, is the truth. That's it. And if I'm in Him, then everything that comes to me is the truth. Yes. By the time it hits you, it is 100% aligned with who you are. But it's the process of understanding that you are not just what you do. You are who He says you are. Therefore, when I step into that position, whatever comes at me, by the time it hits me, it's the truth. Mm -hmm. But we don't like to hear that because, well, how's that going to work? Well, be in Christ and find out. Because being in Christ is not a confession. I am in Christ. I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. I am in Christ. I am in Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm in Christ. No, no, no. In your spirit, you climb into Him. You step into Him. You become one with Him. That's why it says divide your soul and your spirit. Yes. Break it away from each other because the soul is slightly retarded. Well, maybe not your soul, but my soul's got a glitch in its download. It's got issues. It believes stuff that's not true. And it's been taught stuff that's not true. It is sold up into some things that's not a truth. Yeah. So when I step out of my soul and I step into my ancient part, that dimension of me that is one with Yahweh, that is in line with Him, that is in His image and likeness, and that knows Him, and it begins to overshadow me, it changes the way I think. Yes. So imagination. Then you have your mind, which is your, your unconscious, subconscious, and conscious mind. Your emotions. Emotions and feelings go together. But you can't run your life according to those two. I know too many people that does that. Yeah. Choice. Will. All these has to be aligned with the Word of God. Now I say this and I remind you that the Word of God is not just the Bible. I hear people say this all the time and I know that I offend one million people at once when I say this. I can almost guarantee you, you go sit with your father and ask him, did you ask anybody to write a book and call it the Bible? And he will say, no, son. I didn't. It doesn't mean that the word of God is not, an, that the written Bible is not anointed. But you have to remind yourself, Yeshua studied to become a rabbi. He studied books we don't even believe in. Come on, right? The Roman Catholic Church still has books that was written that we don't even have in our Bible. Right. There's, there's prophets that have written things on, on scrolls that we've never even seen. When the Bible says the Word of God, it's not talking about the Bible. 
Yes. So what we've done is we've made a book. That's what we do. That's like, just I said like to his disciples, no, moron, don't build a church here where I have a tr transfigured. They did anyway. Not if you know that. <laughs> so what we've done is we've taken the Bible and made it the only word. If it's not in there, it's not of God. Wow. And you teach anything outside of that book, it's deception. But he says he's the way, the truth, and the life. Exactly. So if he is the word, and there's three dimensions to who he is, then we have that which is written, that which is spoken, and that which is alive. If we only believe in that which is written, then we have only one portion of the truth. Mm. Right. Then there's a big, fat, ugly glitch in your download. <laughs> so we only have a portion. And I say that because the word says, the truth will make you free. It's a process. But well, nobody, I don't know anybody in the church walk that's free. Right. Oh. Now we say free, free of sin, free from sin. No. Not, Not the way we understand it. Because in our understanding, sin is this, 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 and this. But let me tell you something. Sin is missing the mark. And for me to miss the mark, there's certain things I can't do. For you to miss the mark, there's certain things you can't do. Those things might not be the same things. That's why the Bible says the fruits of the Spirit, one of the fruits is self-control. Because in a certain measure, when you have self-control, you can do things that others can't. For example, I can drink a beer. Don't look at me with that term. I'm not an alcoholic, never been. I'm not addicted to it. I can drink a beer and enjoy it. I have friends that can't even look at a beer because he's an alcoholic. So my sin is not his sin. What's wrong for him is not wrong for me. Oh, but you shouldn't drink. Shut up. <laughs> Don't look at me with that tone. I enjoy many, many things in this life because I can't. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of anything or anybody because I know my father. Yes. And I can sit outside with a cigar in my mouth, drinking a beer outside, talking to my daddy for hours. Now, I can't inhale it because I've got asthma. And of course, you don't inhale a cigar. But the idea is the church would look at me and say, oh, yeah, I remember a situation with um, Benny Hinn where they caught him on tape smoking a peace pipe. Yeah. And they had this whole thing about how hypocritic he is. Ach, man, shut up. Shut up. Damn exactly. fool. Come what on. is wrong with you? This religion what does, that does that. If you know your father, if you understand who he is, and you have that control, that engagement of the fullness of who the Holy Spirit is, there's a gateway that opens for you. When I was a little kid, I couldn't swear. If I did, I got a smack bottom, pepper, you name it. There was some all kinds of stuff that came included. But as you grow up, because your parents have put a lid on certain things through your life, and you grow up, you realize, well, I don't go around effing, effing, effing everything. But I can, in occasions, at a certain point, use a specific word that I probably shouldn't use, but it feels really good, especially in traffic. And it doesn't affect me like it would have when I was a kid. Now, I'm, not, I'm not trying to tell you that you can go do all kinds of crazy things. I'm saying that we have to grow up. Because as you mature, you begin to understand things at a different level. Yes. Because Yahweh opens up a gate for you. When you have self-control, when you have engaged the full measure of who He is in that covenant that He desires from you, where you are one with Him, then things open up. Sure do. That's freedom. Freedom has no condemnation. None. And I tell you, I've said this before, conviction is not, how dare you? It's not submission. It's not, I got you, let's hold you, son of a motherless goat. And you better listen to me, I will knock you out. Tap out or die, bitch. You know, we have to understand something. Yahweh, <laughs> I work at a hookah lounge, okay? There's two words I hear all night long. And I can't say the second one, apparently, because that's, I don't know what it is, but it's bitch and nigger. These two words get said all the time. I am known as the white ass nigger. Because I'm from Africa, help me Jesus. I take it, I'll take it. But we have to understand something, you know, Yahweh is calling a company of people that is free in understanding who we are. That there's a measure in which I can stand that doesn't offend Him. 
Might offend the religious. Mm -hmm. But the religious doesn't know him. Right. That's what intimacy Hello. is all about. That's what covenant is all about. I've never cared one bit what they think of me. Because I also know that, you know, I remember a day in my walk with Yahweh where I was sitting at a table, I've shared this many times, and I started vibrating and was at the table with him, with, with Yeshua, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. They were sitting in three different entities, and it was just the four of us, and I started vibrating, like just shaking, and all of a sudden I shifted into Holy Spirit. And the same thing happened to all, both of us, and we shifted into Yeshua. And the same thing happened to all three of us, and we shifted into the Father. Once we were all in one, we shifted into the nations of the world. And it took me to every single city, every single nation. And I went through every single life that's on this planet. And it took me through every man, every woman's life, and what they've gone through, and where they've been. And that sounds crazy, but Yahweh shows me all the time what people go through, where people are at. And let me tell you something, the religious are scary people. It's a scary person. It's, it's, it's a demonic entity that sits in his gate. that does not allow him to know God. Wow. That's why religion killed Jesus. And it will always kill Jesus. But we don't know what religion is. I've had people say to me, Oh, the church is so religious. And I'm thinking, You're the most religious person I know. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> and I remember and I'd say that. What the hell are you talking about? A religious person would say, you can't say hell. Huh? I can say whatever I want you. Exactly. I wear a t-shirt that has a skull on it. I love skulls. In the comments. I can't listen to you, you wear a skull t-shirt. <laughs> you have a skull. You have a skull. You have a skull. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Put a snake wrapped around my chest, not not as a tattoo, on a shirt. You have a snake on your shirt. And? What are you talking about? It's demonic. <laughs> Jesus created that snake. <laughs> I remember we had a goat, Bella. <laughs> we were the Christian Satanists in my town. Because how dare the pastors of this community have a goat? But you want me to have a lamp? We are very religious and we don't know him. I say that. Are you guys okay? Yeah. Come on now. <laughs> Open your first, God, uh, first love gate. This is where you go into your spirit. And you have to understand there is prayer. Now, we have changed the way we pray. It's very important for you to understand this. You know, there was a time in my life where I would... I would wake up in the morning and we go, two minutes later, you're like, wow, that must have been an hour. <laughs> and you look at your watch and you're like, no. <laughs> you know that long, no. <laughs> it's only been two minutes. I only have three hours and 58 minutes left. <laughs> but nowadays, I don't have to talk to him. I sit in Him. And the frequency of who I am vibrates into Him. And the frequency of who He is vibrates into me. Mm -hmm. It's not a language. It's my spirit opening up a gate for the frequency to come together and to open me up. That's why it says this prayer encourages you, lifts you up. Builds your face, speaks mysteries, opens your gateways. That's why it's so key to pray in tongues. Takes you to a deeper level, intimately with Him. But in the same way, I don't sit there and pray for five hours in tongues. I have learned and taught myself to do this all the time in the back of my throat. 24 hours a day, I've, got, I've learned to do it in my sleep. Yep. Don't look at me with that tone, it's part of the night watch. Yep. The night watch is most of the time not what people think it is. It's something you have to practice. It's not just going to happen because you, you're a good Christian. Right. You have to practice shutting your body down, right. taking your soul and your spirit into the kingdom of heaven. You have to learn to do it. It's a practice. Right. It does not happen overnight. It doesn't happen because someone else taught it. And you say, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to do it tonight. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Yeah. Reverence, faith, hope, worship, revelation, intuition, and the fear of God. 
These gates open up a realm where we go into the glory of God. Yes. Into that deep place. Now, I have to remind yourself, His desire for you is to be in a covenant with Him. It's a marriage covenant. Now, as soon as I say marriage covenant, everybody thinks, oh, we are the bride of Christ. Now, shut you the hell up here. You are not the bride of Christ. Look at me. You are not the bride of Christ. Well, you know, it's all I've ever known. I am the bride of Christ. Okay, well, what about the men? Jesus is a man, and I am a man, and I am his bride. But I don't know about you, but that's kind of difficult for me to understand or think of. That's probably why the church is always full of men and not women. Because we have this understanding that I'm the bride of Jesus. So men goes, hey, damn. I don't know about that. But he never wanted us to think like that. He never wants us to understand it like that. Hello. It's a covenant desire that he places in you. It's like unto a bride. That passion, that love, that dedication, that desire for that being that you've met, that you want, that you want to marry and be with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Remind you that, that a, a, a bride is not married yet. It's the day of her wedding. So she's on her way to get married. So the bride has no inheritance. The bride has no intimacy. Because there's not a covenant yet. The bride is engaged. She's not married. Once you get married, you're no longer the bride. You were the bride on your wedding day. So I have to understand, he says, now you are the body and I am the head. Yes. That is a whole nother level of intimacy. A whole nother level. Because it's never been sexual. It's never been that place where I have to really truly know him, know him. And I will pervert an understanding. I remember lying next to him and he says, it's time for us to become one. And my instant thought was, hmm, how's that going to be? <laughs> and he's like, not like that, son. Or he had to rebuke me. And immediately I shifted into him, like my whole being shifted into his being, and I became one with him. And I said this before, my toes and my knees and my calves and my yes. heel and my quads and my glutes and my, my hip and my stomach and my chest and my back and my shoulders and my elbows and my hands and my, my eyes and my nose and my ears all melted into him. And I could see like he does and hear like he does, and I began to speak like he does. Yes. Oh my God. Yes, Lord. Yes. So the marriage covenant, we talked about this, it says, seek to write your ketubah out. Now, the ketubah is a marriage covenant. So in the Hebrew culture, you have different steps. And I don't know what the names of all the steps is, but you will walk through a, past a very pretty little lady and you'll go, <laughs> and you'll walk past her again and say, hey, how you doing? And you'll walk past her again and you'll say, do you want to go on a date? You want to get a drink? I'm going to go for lunch. You walk past her again and you say, you want to marry me. Once you say you want to marry me, the family meets. You sit down and they write a contract. She writes what she wants out of the marriage. And the husband-to-be writes what he wants out of the marriage. They bring the covenant together and it becomes one. And that's what happened on the Mount of Zion with Moses. When he came down with the Ten Commandments, as we believed it, that was the marriage ketubah. That was the contract that Yahweh has written out for us. And what did the church do at that point? The Israelites, they rejected him. Wow. They said, hell no, you're freaking us out. Don't speak to us, speak to him, speak to him, then he can come speak to us. We don't want anything to do with you, you are a scary God. Then the same thing happened on Pentecost. But they said yes. That's when it changed from, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's a marriage ketubah. And your responsibility is to sit down and write out what you want from this relationship. So like I said, I was speaking to someone today and I... Uh, I was just talking about the body, and I remember a time when my body was upset with me. Mm -hmm. I've been a bodybuilder for 34 years. And my body came up in an engagement and said, I'm taking you to the courts. You have beaten me up. You have hurt me. 
You have damaged me. He won the case. Son of a goat. And it wasn't even done yet. And I got a call, a text message from this lady. Now listen to this. She says, I need you on my bed. I'm like, I bind you in the name of Jesus. She's a masseuse, but not a normal masseuse. She, she does a deep tissue, but not even a deep tissue. She brings alignment to your body. So she literally, uh, Paul knows what I'm talking about. He's been there. She breaks you into little portions, and then she puts you back together again. It's like the most, pa most painful four hours of your life. But when you're done, it's like, oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. It's incredible. I remember she was doing something around my ankle. And she was popping all the ligaments and all the stuff out. And then she moves it around and she squeezes it back in with her wrists. She's a little lady. And she almost broke my... It felt like she was going to snap my wrist off. I remember being in a car accident and I broke my coccyx bone. And she took me under her bed or under her arm and aligned me by pushing so hard into places that no one should ever be pushed in. And... The next day, I'm like, what the hell? What happened? I feel fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, my body needed that. And then she carried on doing that for a season of my life almost every month. It was her trade into my body. Four hours. Now, she charges $100 an hour. So, that's $400 that she traded into my body every month. Because my body won the case. And she didn't know anything about that. I hardly knew her, but that's how we got to know each other. That's how she opened a, a spirit school, and that's how I got to know all of the people that I walk with and, walk, and understand now. Because the court case was one of my body, because it's so important to get your body in line. And we don't always understand it, because we were told your body is that piece of trash you need to get rid of, because that's why you can't go to heaven, that's why you can't be perfect, and that's why you've got sin. How are you guys doing? Yeah. But we're beginning to realize, well, no, actually I need to love my body. I need to look after my body. Scientists has told us that your body can live forever. It's literally been designed to live forever. Your skin replaces itself every 21 days. Your organs replace itself every seven years. And your heart is designed to never fail. But because of the food that we take in and the substance abuse that takes place, the medications that we're on, it no longer functions like that. That's why it says, eat of me and drink of me. And that's what changes your DNA. That's where eternal life comes from. Yes. Yes, Lord. Mm. Yes. Ask Yeshua to show you your, your, wedding, or your, your, your wedding vows. Yes. Now please, again, I'm not talking about marrying Jesus. Bring that contract before him. What do you want out of this covenant relationship with him? I always want to be saved, brother. I want to be obedient. Let's do everything he does. Shady up he. Exactly. Listen to me. That's not what he wants. He doesn't want you to be a robot that does everything he says. That's not relationship. Not. I don't do everything my, 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 my partner want me, wants me to do. No, I'm going to argue with that. I don't want to do that. Oh, I don't like that. That's how relationships built. People don't understand that me and God argue all the time. I don't like everything he tells me, and I'm sure he doesn't like everything I tell him. But he's my best friend. Best. He's the only person I trust, the only one I truly, truly walk with, that knows me. I don't have to say anything to him, I don't have to lie to him, I don't have to hide anything from him. He's my everything, he's the reason I breathe, he's the hay. Yes. That's, what, that's what Moses had on that mountain. You know Moses told God to repent? Yes. The Almighty God. That can go. Hmm. <laughs> I had to repent because his friend said you are wrong. Ooh. Ooh. Now maybe God did that on purpose. But he sees his nation worship a cow. I don't know who does that. I mean I want to eat a cow. But I'm not going to worship it. A good steak might look like you want to worship it every now and then. But I don't know about that. Golden calf. Uh, who worships a calf? Rather worship a bull. Looks much more masculine. Anyway. He gets upset. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to start a whole new nation through you. 
And Moses says, no, God. You can't do that. That's your nation. Repent. That's friendship. That's covenant. It sure is. You know, with an Ezekiel, they had to lie on his side naked. And he always says to him, you need to make, you will cook food with human dung. Yeah. He goes, what? What? <laughs> it says, <clears throat> uh, Lord, can we do cow dung? <laughs> well, you should be obedient. What the hell are you doing? Well, it's my best friend. I can talk to him. I can say no to him. Not a very good idea. But that's how you build a relationship with a bit of fighting. That's it. Hello. I remember some of my best friends got knocked out several times by me. <laughs> so I had this friend, I love him, I honor him. He's a beautiful and incredible young man. But one day, because we were a big, big group of friends in school, and one day, I don't know what he, he was doing, but he was upset with me, and he's like, two foot nine, and he's like, oh, I'm gonna kick your butt, and he's like swinging, and I'm like, these friends are holding it back, I'm standing there. So he, he invites me to a fight. The fight would start at four o'clock behind the library in Western area, a little mine town I lived in in South Africa. So I get there at 10 past 4, he's standing there, I walk up to him, give him two shots on his lip, his tooth pops through his, his lip. Everybody stops, stop, stop, stop. It's not 4 o'clock yet. I'm like, okay. Okay, so 4 o'clock comes and I beat the living snot out of this poor kid. Like I hit him so hard that his eyes rolled back, I broke my little pinky. If you can see this pinky can't close. I break my pinky on his face. He's blue from here all the way down. His entire mouth, his lip, everything swollen shut. We were best friends afterwards. We're still best friends. Then I had to get to a point where I said, well, well, I could never say that you won or I won because I broke my hand and your face was completely snatched up. I remember two of my other friends, they, they're both pit bulls. Have you ever known what a pit bull is? Like, it doesn't stop. Like, they just see black and they just go crazy. So these two friends, they get into some kind of a thing and they start fighting like that. It's just blood everywhere. We can't even stop them because they're like just crazy. And afterwards, they're best friends. Best, best of best friends. <laughs> and he's like, what are you going to do with God? Well, look at Jacob. Yeah, yeah. Wrestled. He wrestled with Yahweh. That's a fight. Mm -hmm. Now we think wrestling, AWF or WWE. Uh, AWF is the wrestling I did, but Wrestling in the old uh, in the old days was I'm kicking the living snot out of you. Mm -hmm. Come on. Wasn't it? It was a fist fight. It was blood and guts. It was to the death. <laughs> and that's that's how you grow in it. Be open. This is your best friend. This is the God of of your life. He's created you. You can't hide anything from Him. He craves that with you. It's not some religious act that you have to do. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Remind yourself of the God and in your heart. Hmm. Ask Yeshua to garden with you in the garden of your heart. Speak to Him in your garden. This is the place inside of you. So the kingdom of God is in the inside of you. Right? He's got the bridal chamber. He's got the dance floor. He's got the... There's two others. I'm not can't remember them right now, but it's a soaking room, and, and there's another one. Um, dance, hey, bridal chamber, dance. No, anyway, the, the garden. Yes, yeah, so there's this stuff in your heart that you create to make it comfortable for him to come into. Right? Are you guys good? Yes. yes. It's a place I create inside of me. Was this where I meet him first? Yes. Then I invite him into me. So I invite him to come live in me. That's where I begin to engage with him. And then he's like, well, you know, that's not quite how a relationship works. If you only come to my house all the time, eventually I'm going to wonder, do you even have a house? Why are you always coming to my house? I want to go to your house a little bit. I want to know what your house looks like, right? Yeah. So he doesn't just want to be in your house the whole time. He wants you to get to a point where you're like, can I go to your house now? Yeah. Can I go see you? Can I go see what you do? Of course, let's go. That's why you're seated in Christ. It's his desire. 
When you have done some righteous acts, you can plant the seeds in your garden to bear fruit. And I remember lying on the floor right there soaking up. And I remember the father come to me and he says, he says, I, 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 I need you to bring all that which you have gathered in, in the last two years. It was about seven years ago. So I was like, that's a lot. I've grown more in two years than what I've grown in, in 20 years of being a Christian. I mean, I've done 13 years of theology studies. I could have my doctorate already. And in the two years that I entered into the kingdom of heaven, he's taught me more than what those 13 years could bring me. Now you want me, he says, I want you to gather all your fruits, all that, that which you've gained over the last two years, and I want you to trade it. I was freaked out because he literally stripped me naked in the spirit. And I was like, what did I do wrong? Why do you want all this? He says, well, I can't elevate you to the next level if you don't trade all your fruits. Because the only way I can take you to the next level is if you, take, if I, if you give me what you have so I can multiply it back to you. Because that's a, that's a reminder that I give you that you can never give Yahweh anything that he wouldn't multiply back to you. Now, how many of you understand? He doesn't need anything you have. Right. But when you take what you have and sow it into Him, He has the capacity to sow it back into you, multiply it. Yes. Because I remind you that every level you go to, you need another dimension of what you previously had. So for every level, once Yahweh says you need a trade, and you start giving what you've earned over the previous season of your life, and you lay that down at the throne, you lay that down at the sea of glass, he multiplies that back to you so that you can go to the next level. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Glory. How are you guys doing? Good. You may see things grow like trees with crowns or swords <laughs> on it. You can journal out conversations with him. Ask him what he thinks. This is the garden of your heart. This is the, the place within you. Then we look at the, the, the waterfall, waterfall at the source of the river. Spend time with him around the waterfall where the river of life comes out of the mountain of Yahweh. Now please, these places are in the kingdom of heaven, guys. So this is like you're going to find this. Anyway, when you go into the kingdom of heaven, you're going to see how the tree of life works, how the river of life flows through it, yeah. and you get to be in that place. It's a place of intimacy. Yes. It's a desire he carries for you to go into. That's why we sit and we meditate. It's not, you're not emptying yourself, you're filling yourself. You close your eyes and you take yourself on a journey as your spirit begins to reflect images to your soul of the things that you need to engage, or the things that you're busy engaging, and you start making a picture of it in your mind. You say, well, that's your imagination. You're just making up stuff. No, your imagination is inward sight. It's your spirit reflecting to your soul what it's doing in the kingdom of heaven. And you are taking the pictures that it brings and putting it into order to make a, an engagement for it to become an understanding in who you are. Yes. And eventually, as you do that often, or day, every day, it becomes a reality. It becomes easier. You begin to understand it more, and it begins to build up on you who you are. Right. Yes, thank you. The first time you hear this, you're like, huh? Second time you hear this, you're like, huh? Third time you hear it, you're like, hmm. Fourth time, it doesn't happen overnight. You have to remind yourself when you come into this meeting, one of the main things in the beginning that you will be saying to yourself is, get out of my soul, get out of my soul, get out of your soul, get out of your soul. This is a spirit school. It's not for your soul. Your soul is slightly glitched out. It's going to tell you, oh, where's that in the scripture? Ah, that's not what I was taught. I was told something else. This is not true. This is a lie. That way you're, you're deceiving God's people. This is not right. And your spirit goes, shut up. I'm trying to listen to this guy. What are you talking about? You don't know anything. You were born into sin. You have no revelation. Whatever you've heard up to this point has only been one portion of the truth. He's adding the other two and you can't receive it. Sit down, boy. <laughs> you guys okay? <laughs> Spend time with him around the waterfall where the river of life comes out of the mountain of Yahweh. Yes. Let him take you on an adventure with him. Um, simply to spend time away in heaven with him. Yes. Yes. This is a different type of worship. Because he opens up realms to you and you're engaging it. Right. And I've said this many times. It's really the only example that makes sense. When I go eat at a restaurant, I can say thank you to the waitress. I can walk out there and I can tell everybody about the nice food I had. I can tell everybody that they should go there, they should go eat there. The food's incredible. And I can talk about this restaurant until I turn blue in my face. All I'm doing all the time is I'm giving glory to the chef. 
Because he's the one that cooked the food. Yeah. Right? If Yahweh places something in front of you, and it's a seven spirit, so it's an angelic being, or it is one of the saints of old, or men in white linen, or one of the 24 elders, or a living letter. He's placing it before you to engage, because they are designed to take you to a deeper place in intimacy, and a, a greater level of understanding of who he is. They are designed to take you deeper. It's not taking anything away from him. That's worship. <coughs> How you guys doing? Yes. This may be uh, swimming together. It's more... But the very first thing I did after I divided soul and spirit is I went into the woods and I started flying through the sky. Yeah. Well, brother, you're out of your mind. <laughs> I've never been in a place in my life where I've been closer to God than what I am now. Yes. There's no separation. There's no condemnation. We don't even understand that because we condemned about everything because the church has taught us to be afraid. Sure has. I don't even understand. The perfect love Can't casts out all fear. Mm -hmm. If you have no fear, you have the perfect love. Ooh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. How you guys doing? Good. The throne of grace. Envision the throne room and your father seated, seated there. Come boldly before his throne of grace as the scripture says, and sit with him. Present your heart. Ask him to show you how he sees you and to give you the affirmation and encounter and encouragement you need. Yes. It's what the Father desires for you. That's how you grow deeper. You, know, you can't grow deeper because you listen to a message. And I've listened to every, I say this, every message Ian Clayton, my mentor, has ever preached. But I've learned over the years that I cannot listen to anything he preaches. I have to take one message, go into that message, and meditate in it and over and over and over and over again. Make it a gate. If I say, if he says something that I want to engage, stop and engage it immediately. Yes. Spend time in it. Let your, your spirit soak in it. Begin to understand it. Oh, but what if you get deceived? Well, what if you don't? We're all deceived anyway. Try to tell you that. We've been deceived. We've been deceived. Now, it was no one's intention to deceive us. It was never their, dece their, their intention. My pastor was one of the most incredible, beautiful, phenomenal, mind-blowing men I've ever met in my life. He never meant to deceive, but he only had one portion of the truth. So everything I was taught over the years that I was there was a measure. And as I grew up, I received another measure. As I grew up, I received another measure. Now I can't go back to that first measure because that first measure is only a small portion. Yeah. I want the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. The whole. Right? Yes. Entangle your DNA with the Trinity. Tether to heaven. Mm. Ask the Father to reveal His heart of love to you and your identity in Him. By faith and your imagination, visualize yourself stepping into Yeshua and uh, then into His heart and being in entwined with his heart and transformed yep. yeah. this is why your imagination is so extremely yes. important well it's my imagination I'm, I'm making stuff up no 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 that is yeah. sorry there's too many gates open yeah my spirit wants to be in 500,000 places all at once <laughs> you got the gate yes to so your imagination it's not the same as fantasies. your fantasies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was Olympic when it comes to fantasies. Oh. Yes. Wow. Woo. 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 I was good. I was very good. Right? Like Olympic. But my imagination is different. Uh, a fantasy is something you make up. Right. Your imagination is something that comes from the inside of you that you are seeing. That's reflecting itself. Yeah. And that's usually your spirit. That's showing you what it's doing in the kingdom of heaven. And when you take all these pictures and you put them together, it takes you on an engagement and a new revelation is birth, new understanding in who you are as a spirit, and you begin to open up to the Father can pour more into you. Mm. Yeah. So it's important to have that. Mm. Yeshua can give us his heart. Just ask him. Ask for his seal on it. 
ask for molding and shaping of your desires. Yes. You can step into Yeshua's heart and merge your heart with His. Yeah. <laughs> now this is a very interesting one. Use your pain. Well, brother, what are you smoking? <laughs> Use your pain as a springboard into intimacy. Right. Look, I went through a divorce three years ago and it destroyed me. It was the very last thing I ever thought would happen. The very last thing I ever wanted. When she said, I want a divorce, there was a, what? Uh, are you out of your mind? <coughs> it was hurt. It was extremely painful. But that three, those three years, have been three years today, not exactly. But those three years was a molding. It was a, a, a most intimate time with Yahweh I've ever had. And 90% of all our conversations was a fight. I remember a friend of mine, he had to have a hip replacement. He was operating at average between 7 and 9 on a pain scale, mm. if it's out of 10. Mm. And that eventually became his gate into the kingdom of heaven. Right. I remember, this is going to be crazy, because if you're religious, you're going to think, well, you know. <laughs> I have a tattoo on the very strange part of my arm right there. And who? <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. Yeah. When she did that, this tattoo, it's a Punisher skull with Galatians 2.20 in it. Yes. And then fire burning inside of it. <laughs> and I remember when she did this, it was the most excruciating thing I ever experienced. Like, I wanted to punch this beautiful young lady in the face. But what I did is I learned in that very quickly how to step into the spirit. Because it became a gate. Pain became a gate for me to shift my spirit and my soul into another realm. When she could finish my tattoo and I didn't feel it. No, that wasn't, that sounds like, oh, well, that's your motive, not feel the pain. Yes. Because the pain is a gate for you to go in. And it doesn't have to be a physical pain only. I had an emotional pain and it was a gate for me to go into the spirit and to see my father, to get out of that depressed place, to get out of anxiety. You know, what's going to happen to my kids? What's going to happen to us? How's this going to work? Where's this going to be? You know, we come from another country. We're not, not born yet. And we're not birthed yet. I'll be separated. My kids are in California. I'm on this side. What's going on? You know, it's freaked me out. But it also opened up a gateway. Your pain is important. Well, it's a pain. It's not from God. Well, make it from God. Because he says, I will take whatever the, evil, the enemy brings against you, and I'll make it for good. Yeah, right. I'll turn it around. It's going to bless many people. Yes, he's right. That's who he is. When you are in painful circumstances, visualize Yeshua putting his arm around your shoulders and remember he never leaves you. Remember that at the moment you can uh, bury, bury your head into his shoulders and release the struggles and burdens to him. Uh, let, the pain, this is something, let the pain drive you to Yeshua yeah. as your safety. Yes. It's important. It's a thing that we can do consistently. Trade on the sea of glass for intimacy. And I remember, and I'm going to see if I can close with this. I remember, uh, and I said I said I shared this just recently, um, but I remember the father putting an option before me and saying that because I've desired intimacy and I've desired revelation. And so I have these two saints of old appear in front of me and they each have a mantle in their arms, you know, wrapped over their arm like this, that they no longer need on their shoulders. So that basically is the son of Yahweh in creation that passed, and went into the kingdom of heaven, and he has a mantle like Elijah. Mm -hmm. Elisha. Mm -hmm. I don't get these two right. Elijah had a mantle he left for Elisha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I only remember that order because Elijah is J, which is first in the alphabet, and Sha is last. It's the only way that I remember those two, because who the hell has got the same names like that? <laughs> But I had these two mantles and I wanted them because one was fire and one was intimacy. Now fire always represents revelation. And that's the two mantles I wanted. But I knew in my heart for me to get these two mantles to the measure that I want them, I had to lay something down. I had to trade something at the sea of glass. And the only other mantle I had that I could lay down was the mantle of love. And I've walked with this for a long time and I didn't want to trade it. And I had to wait until the Father echoed in my heart was this, I will never take anything from you without multiplying it back to you. 
So I took this mantle and I laid it down and he gave me a mantle back that had love, intimacy and fire combined. And he put it onto my shoulders that's changed my life. He even said to me, I'm going to take you through a season in your life where you get to know me. Where intimacy will be your focus and I will take you on a journey like you've never been. And revelation will be the result. And he says in his word that my people die because of lack of knowledge. So if I reverse that, my people live because of knowledge. The revelation and knowledge go hand in hand. The more revelation and understanding you have, the more life you have. And it's a Zoe life, it's a God life. So the deeper you go into who he is. Yes. Every time you are given something like a crown or you, you, uh, you give your, your time to a godly purpose, go into the sea of glass and lay down. How are you guys doing? Good. Enter into the bridal chamber or soaking room or dance floor. That's what it is. We've got the garden, the bridal chamber, the soaking room, the dance floor. This is the most intimate place as one of the four chambers of your heart. Stand before Yeshua and see what happens. Let your time away with Him be a delight and a treasured time. No, it's not just, oh, Father, bless me. Thank you for supplying my needs and forgiving my sins. Enter into a place with Him. Allow Him to surround you with His presence and His glory. See it. Picture it. Create it if it's not there. And I say, well, you're not making up stuff. No, your spirit is creating you a, 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 a vision, a visual. So you can see what your spirit is engaging already. Mm -hmm. You're not making this up. I'll repeat this. You will not make it up. You are not making it up. Yeah. We have to begin to trust what we see. Believe what we see. You're in Christ. In Christ is truth. Yeah. How are you guys doing? Yeah. This is amazing. Let your time away with Him be at a light and a treasure time. It is a sacred uh, Try, uh, try, and it is not as religion name, names it a time to read your Bible. <laughs> I've no problem reading your Bible, but that's not time spent with Him. Right. right. If I'm sitting uh, with my girlfriend and I'm reading a letter she wrote me, how many of you understand I'm not spending time with her? Right. She's going to sit there and she's going to be like, What are you doing? I'm reading your letter, but I'm right here. Well, I'm, I'm just reading the letter. I want to know what you said to me. Well, I'm right here. Why don't you talk to me? Engage me. Hug on me. Love on me. See, we've made the Bible too much. Too much. I'm not saying that it's not relevant. It's very, very, extremely relevant. It's the belt. It's what holds everything together. But it's just a love letter. It's just something he wrote to us, to ignite us, to draw us in. It's a gateway into him. It's a gateway to go into all of who he is. How are you guys doing? Good. Be led by him for how he wants you to spend the time together. Remind yourself that you are uh, meeting for a date with your eternal bridegroom. Now, again, don't misunderstand that. It's the covenant. It's the type of relationship. It's the, it's the only explanation he can give you that you'll understand. Because in creation, that's the highest form of intimacy, a marriage relationship. Because if he said, well, do this like you would be unto you, do unto your body, then we'd be like, hmm, because we hate our bodies. I've said that before, we've been told that it's your, your body's fault that you don't see God. It's your body's fault that you can't go to heaven right now. It's your body's fault you can't be perfect. You have to wait until you die. So basically my body's in the way of all the stuff that I want, which is absolutely not true. Right? right. Any response? Mm -hmm. Like, like, hello. Hello. <laughs> By desire, go and allow the Lord to refresh you and draw you near. Yes. Let him guide you. Enjoy it. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Allow Him to dwell in you. Find yourself in a place where you're aware of Him. That's why it says, eat of me and drink of me as, uh, as often as you are aware of me. So basically what He's asking is, hey, be aware of me all the time. Yes. So you can engage me all the time. So we can be one all the time. Yes. So there's an intimacy. That, that's what He's saying. Is, hey, remind yourself that you are the body and I'm the head. 
There's no separation. We're always together. We're always in communication. We're always talking. We're always one with each other. We're always there for each other. I can't go anywhere without my body. Not the natural, anyway. How you guys doing? Father, we want to love on you and pray and worship you. And I know that there's so much more in my notes that we can go through, but our time has run out. I'll make a part two. I ask, Father, that you'll take everyone in this room on a journey, a journey into a deeper place and covenant relationship. Let's begin to understand what it means to live a life without condemnation, a life where it's conviction. Conviction is such a gentle, loving, kind act. So you're always looking at me saying, Son, you can continue to do that if you want to. I'm not going to hate you. I'm not going to love you less. I'm not going to take anything from you. But you're not going to grow to where condemnation says, well, you, you're you just going to keep on doing that, you low-down, dirty dog. You want to go to church now. You want to tell people you love Jesus, but that's what you do. That's where you're at. It's condemnation. It condemns you. It breaks you down. It tells you you're not good enough. You lie. You're a hypocrite. That's not the truth. Conviction is gentle. And Yahweh is calling a people that is one with Him, that loves Him, that worships Him, that, that has no regret, that just lives a life, that eats of the tree of life, does not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not a doodle list. It's not, yes, I can do this. No, I can't do that. No, I climb into life. I engage my Father. I live and move and have my being in Him. I worship Him. I glorify Him. I magnify Him. I ask, Father, that You'll open up the eyes of Your people to take them to a deeper place in You. Let's see it. Let's perceive it. Let's understand it. Let's walk in it. And let's realize that this is the journey you have us on to perfect us, to be in a perfect place with you. You say, let be perfect for I'm perfect. And we thought that was impossible, but now we know through the dimensions of the word that we can become perfect. When we remove the enemy out of our lives, we do yes. not get condemned. Condemnation will take life from you. Conviction adds life to you. Father, we love you. We praise you. We say to my King, in the name of Yeshua.